okay for life. Um, yeah, everything's fine on YouTube. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another talk in our webinar series. This webinar is also being streamed live on YouTube. You can find the link on our website or access it on our YouTube channel at Linea MCTI. Today we have the honor of having Dr. Sebastian Bouquet, a professor at the Ludwig Maximilians University of, um, in Munich. Dr. Bouquet works on different aspects of cosmology using galaxy clusters. This involves data sets from um, various collaborations like SBT, DS, Erosita, and the upcoming LSST and um, CMBS4. Um, he uses the surveys as well as numerical simulations and statistics. Um, Dr. Bouquet is also actively involved in cosmological surveys that explore the sky and our universe are different wavelengths. Um, so Dr. Bouquet, thank you so much for being so kind and having accepted to give us a webinar talk today on this interesting topic. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. If I may, um, faculty at LMU and not a professor. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I just assumed it meant the same thing. No, uh, it's, it's complicated in Germany. Anyway, okay. um, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So let's uh, jump right in uh, first with a nice picture. Uh, this is the South Pole Telescope. Uh, one of the surveys we're going to use to learn about cosmology. Um, so obviously this work, uh, I'll be discussing a lot of work I've done over the past couple of years, obviously in close collaboration with many folks here at Munich, but also obviously collaborators uh, within the South Pole Telescope and Dark Energy Survey collaborations. So let's get started um, <clears throat> discussing why would we do cluster cosmology in the first place. So if we take one step back, uh, if we want to learn about cosmology, really we're asking ourselves, what does the universe look like and why? So if we look at these three simulation boxes on the top left here, these are volumes of the universe simulated on a computer for different cosmological models. So the left one would be close to what we think our universe actually looks like. Uh, the middle one is without dark energy. And the one on the right hand side here would be with warm dark matter instead of cold dark matter. And the point here is really that you can see by eye that structures look different. Um, there's more clumps here in this middle panel and less clumps on the right hand side. So this tells you that if you observe uh, the universe, you should be able to infer, um, you know, if we have dark energy or warm dark matter or stuff in between. So this is true for the large scale structure in general. If we now uh, concentrate on galaxy clusters and on dark matter halos, this would be these very massive structures at the nodes of this cosmic web of all these filaments that we see here. So if we now switch to the plot on the right hand side, um, we see two different cosmological models where time would go from left to right. And all these highlights here are where there are massive dark matter halos. And the point here again is very qualitative. If we look in the top row, this would be in Lambda CDM cosmology. We see that we would have a fair amount of high redshift, massive dark matter halos. Whereas if we look in an Einstein de Sitter universe, a dramatically different universe, there would be basically no high redshift galaxy clusters. And so this tells you that if you can measure the abundance of galaxy clusters over time, you can really differentiate between these two models. So that's a very qualitative, very basic uh, view. I think another point I would like to make is that a lot of large-scale structure cosmology these days is based on correlation, two-point correlation functions, so shear and galaxy positions. And I just would like to make the point that counting massive halos is qualitatively a very different probe of the large-scale structure than measuring two-point correlation functions. So we're not exactly measuring the same uh, modes of the matter field. And so we are really expecting to be doing complementary analyses. All right, now let's formalize all this a little bit and look at a rather old plot, um, uh, you know, very important cluster cosmology work by Alexei Beklinen. 
And so uh, if we now do what I described previously, we count the number of massive halos in the universe, we can compare that to theory predictions. And that's what's happening in this plot here. So on the left-hand side, uh, we're comparing the abundance of galaxy clusters in two redshift bins, and we're overimposing a well-fitting model, which is the Lambda CDM model. And on the right-hand side, it's the same data points, but the model has no dark energy. And so you can see by eye that this is a very poor description of the data. So this is kind of a cartoonish way of thinking of how we will learn about the parameters um, of our universe. Um, just explaining a little bit where this theory model comes from, since we're looking at very non-linear scales in the matter density field, the prediction for the number of massive halos, the so-called halo mass function, comes from numerical simulations. Okay, so from this picture, things look uh, rather nice. Uh, there's obviously one big complication. This plot here is the number of halos as a function of their mass. And as you all know, massive galaxy clusters look something like that. So, you know, nowhere uh, does it say what the mass of these objects are. And so the key point of, or the key challenge that we're gonna tackle in this talk is how we go from observations like this to, uh, you know, relating this to a theory model. So what we have to do is to actually model these observables. And with that, let me come to the program for uh, this talk. Um, I will, after this, you know, very basic introduction I just gave, I will just jump right into doing a cosmological analysis with the South Pole Telescope. Uh, so basically the 2019 state of the art. After that, I'll discuss what we've been doing since 2019. And I'll highlight a work I'm uh, very excited about, which is a combination of uh, SPT data and data from dark energy surveys. So that's where the multi-wavelength component comes in. And finally, I'll discuss uh, you know, where we're headed in terms of South Pole Telescope cluster science with the SPT3G survey. So let's do a cosmological analysis and try to walk uh, through the steps to getting constraints. So we're starting with a telescope. Uh, we're starting with the South Pole Telescope here. I've shown a nice picture in the beginning. It's a 10 meter telescope at the South Pole or just one kilometer off it. Uh, it's a 10 meter mirror, so you get arc minute resolution in millimeter wavelengths. Um, there's been different surveys conducted with the South Pole Telescope. Um, the SPT-SZ survey, which was the first generation, then came SPT-Pole, that added polarization capability. And we're currently running SPT3G, which is taking data. So the important point for now is just to uh, know that what we'll be talking about for the next couple of minutes is solely based on SPT-SZ. So the first generation data set over 2,500 square degrees. So as I said, we're observing the sky in millimeter wavelengths. So how do we find galaxy clusters? We find them through the Sunya Zeldovich effect. Um, so basically, it's a small fraction of the cold CMB photons from the cosmic microwave background that undergo inverse Compton scattering with the hot electrons in a galaxy cluster. Um, so the, the plots here are a dramatic exaggeration of the effect. So you can imagine the perfect black body spectrum, which is the dashed line here, gets shifted to higher frequencies through this effect. And on the right-hand side, if you look at the spectral distortion this induces, you get this characteristic decrement below 220 gigahertz and an increment beyond. And then in blue here are hi highlighted the three frequency bands of SPT. So we would observe we seen as the decrement. The important point is that this SZ flux is proportional to the thermal energy in the cluster electrons. And this effect is independent of redshift, or almost independent. So what this means is if we have a big millimeter wave telescope with good angular resolution, we can really detect galaxy clusters out to the highest redshifts where clusters exist. And we understand the SZ effect very well so we really understand what we're observing. 
So on the right hand side here is a roughly 50 square degree cutout uh, of an SPT survey. So you see the primary CMB anisotropies, you see point sources, bright point sources at 150 gigahertz. And we see the stuff I'm interested in, which are these black shadows, which are the SZ decrement at 150 gigahertz. So these are cluster candidates from SPT. So now that we have a list of SZ candidates, uh, we need to gather more data to be able to interpret them. The first challenge is, as I said, the SZ effect is basically independent of redshift. So we, just by seeing the SZ signal, we cannot really tell if it's a cluster at redshift 0.1 or a cluster at redshift 2. So we get all these high redshift clusters, but we do not have the redshift. So the first task is to do an extensive, um, sorry, I should start at the top. So first, what we have, what I discussed so far, is the SPT detection catalog. So characterized by four numbers, we'd have the detection significance, the filter scale, it's a technical detail basically, and then the position on the sky RA and deck. And for the cosmological analysis, we're gonna apply these cuts. So significance greater five and redshift greater 0.25. And by the way, similar processing is done uh, for the Planck survey or the Atacama cosmology telescope. Next step, as I started discussing, is we need to follow up these clusters with optical or near infrared data to confirm that there's actually an overdensity of galaxies and to get a redshift. And that's highlighted uh, by the plot on the top right. Next, we got some more follow-up data. So that's mostly led by uh, Mike McDonald and collaborators with an SPT. We got a lot of data from Chandra, so X-ray data. And you can see uh, on the bottom histogram here, where black, the black histogram is the SPT cluster candidates and blue is the X-ray follow-up and we really cover a huge redshift range. And last but not least, to do robust cosmology, we got weak lensing data uh, of SPT clusters from Magellan and Hubble. And these are the green and orange histograms here. So here as well, we're covering a pretty good range of redshifts. So again, uh, now we have collected all the data. And I would just like to stress that I say that we collected these data. We did not collect cluster masses. We collected cluster observables. And why I'm making this point will become clear right now. So what we have now is a data set with many different observables. Uh, what do we do? How do we model this? So I would like to start very general with uh, what I call the very basic framework of relating observables to halo mass. And I would just claim that the bigger a halo is, the stronger it's a Z signal or X-ray signal or lensing signature should be. And I think that everyone will agree with the statement. Um, also in general, there should be some redshift evolution, of course. Now let's add some complications to the model. There is intrinsic scatter in this observable to mass relation. So basically just saying no two clusters are the same. So two clusters of the same mass would still look different. And so that's this intrinsic variability. To add even more complication, this intrinsic scatter in different observables should be correlated in general. For example, because clusters are triaxial, so if you long, look along the major axis of a cluster, that should boost almost all your observables. And then there's more astrophysical complications that should also lead to some correlation or anti-correlation. Now, the important point is with this rather basic model, we're already able to write down a likelihood function for the cluster sample. Um, this looks uh, rather complicated with quite a few quite nasty uh, integrals. So for modeling this uh, data set, I would just point out that you get up to quadruple integrals in the modeling, which just means that you need to be very careful about writing an efficient code if you want this to run within days instead of months. I would just like to highlight two elements to this likelihood. The top part here is, uh, you might recognize, it's basically a Poisson likelihood of observing clusters in your sample. And the bottom part is the multi-observable part where we say, for example, the probability of observing an X-ray signal, Yx, and the lensing signal, GT, given uh, an SPT detection significance and redshift. So this is really where the multi-observable data comes in. I will stress once more that this likelihood is formulated 
as a function of observables, not of halo mass. In fact, if you look very carefully at all these integrals, you will realize that the variable mass, m, is actually marginalized over. So we're really modeling the observables. Okay, very nice. Now we have a likelihood function. We're not done yet. Um, because this likelihood function depends on unknown parameters in the observable mass relation. This was very uh, famously uh, shown in this plot here uh, that you probably all know from the Planck 2015 cluster analysis, where they assume different um, choices for modeling the observable mass relation. And depending on these different models, they get different constraints in this omega matter and sigma eight plane. So, you know, if you take this to the extreme, if you say, I don't know anything about how to relate observables to mass, then you don't learn anything about cosmology. So we really need to add mass information to learn about cosmology. Now we could use predictions um, for the SZ mass relation or X-ray mass relation from first principles on numerical simulations, but I do not want to do that because our knowledge of these uh, ICM physics, intracluster um, medium physics, is systematically limited by uncertainties in astrophysics and AGN feedback and so on. So this is not a good choice, I would say. However, we understand weak lensing very well. <clears throat> Why is that? Well, weak lensing is really sourced by the entire mass distribution of a halo. And so this is really dominated by gravitational physics, which we know how to model. And I will come back to that a bit later. For now, I'll just say we really know how to model the cluster lensing signal within some uncertainties using numerical simulations that mostly basically model the gravitational interactions. Okay, now we have mass information. Now we can do a cosmological analysis. And so this is the SPT result as of 2019. Uh, importantly, I will point out, so we're using 343 SPT selected clusters of which 32 have weak lensing data and 89 have X-ray data. The mass calibration information is limited by uh, the statistical uncertainties in the lensing measurements. It's not yet limited by the systematic uncertainties, which I highlight in this table here. So for that analysis, our systematic uncertainties in lensing mass calibration are roughly five to nine percent, and again, as this, uh, sorry, our statistical uncertainties are larger. And once we run the full analysis, we get this result uh, that I'm showing here. So, looking at the omega matter and sigma eight plane, so the amount of matter in the universe and the amount of inhomogeneity or clumpiness sigma eight. And so, the blue contours here are our SPT result that I'm comparing, for example, to Planck primary CMB anisotropies. Um, <clears throat> so their 2015 result. Then another cluster cosmology experiment with X-ray selected clusters by the Wayne the Giants team in green. And then cosmic shear and galaxy clustering analyses by KIDS and the Dark Energy Survey in red and orange, respectively. So my key takeaway from this plot, uh, if two uh, takeaways. First, all of these probes seem to be reasonably consistent with one another. There's maybe a hint that the large-scale structure-based probes are all a bit offset compared to Planck. And the other uh, take is that our uncertainties in blue are not you know, much worse than the other probes. So I think we're definitely competitive and so um, very excited about that. And that also tells me that uh, you know, it's worth pushing further, especially since I said that we're limited by statistical uncertainties. So getting more data should help us to do better. So before we do that, I'd like to highlight one or two additional results from that analysis. Um, so here I'm showing mega matter and sigma eight. Um, before even looking at these constraints, you might wonder, well, am I actually describing my data set well? So that's what I'm showing here. And I'm claiming that, yes, I am. Um, so I'm showing the SPT cluster sample here as a histogram in redshift and the SPT detection significance. So the histograms are the data set and then the green bands are the mean recovered model uh, from that cosmological analysis. 
within the Poisson uncertainties, which are the dashed, uh, sorry, the dotted lines. And so the takeaway here is really the model seems to be a good description of the data. Um, so we can really trust the results I just presented. And um, this seems to be a, um, this all seems to be working out really. Now let's look at another uh, cool test uh, we did. So besides just looking at omega matter and sigma eight, we also wanted to leverage the fact that we really detect these high redshift clusters. And so we can uh, ask ourselves, what can we constrain sigma eight? So the, the amount of structure in the universe as a function of redshift, or if you want really probing structure formation as a function of time. So what this plot shows you is assuming a lambda CDM model with massive neutrinos, you can use the Planck primary CMB measurement and basically compute what sigma eight in the local universe should be, and that's a red band. And then you can use the SPT cluster sample, and instead of just measuring sigma eight and redshift zero, you can measure it in these four redshift intervals I'm showing here. And uh, I would just like to point out that our error bars are already quite nice for this kind of comparison. Uh, orange is then the same analysis, just with a slightly more flexible model. And as you can see that more, that additional flexibility did not seem to break things. So two takeaways from this plot. Uh, one is all our blue and orange error bars slightly lower than the red band from Planck. That's expected because as I said a couple minutes ago, our sigma eight uh, was also a bit lower than Planck. So we would expect some offset, but what's reassuring in this plot is that this offset seems to be constant as a function of redshift. So basically we do not observe that anything crazy happens, for example, at redshift one. So there really just seems to be this constant, mildly significant offset in sigma eight. And uh, I think this is really cool in what SZ clusters can give you because with future generation surveys, I will show a forecast for SPT3G can really probe to even higher redshifts. So with that, I'm concluding the first part uh, of this talk. Just want to summarize the state of the art for SPT cluster cosmology, which is still this 2019 result, uh, which I'd just like to highlight that there are two instances where numerical simulations were used. Uh, first is to calibrate the halo mass function. As I said in the beginning, uh, we need some numerical simulations to calibrate that because it's a nonlinear evolution of the matter field. And to calibrate, and numerical simulations were used to calibrate the relationship between halo mass and weak gravitational shear. So as I said, this is mostly gravity, and so we know how to simulate that. In terms of the cluster observables, um, the SZ and X-ray to mass relations are modeled uh, by rather simple power law models with a priori unknown parameters. And the mass calibration information is coming from weak lensing and is currently limited by the rather small sample size of only 32 clusters with lensing data. Okay, then let's uh, start part two of the talk. Would just like to highlight a couple of highlights um, since uh, 2019 and how this builds toward getting a more precise cosmological analysis. First uh, work I did with the team at Argonne National Lab, uh, trying to get a better model for the halo mass function. Um, as I said, the halo mass function is kind of the key theoretical prediction for doing cluster abundance measurements. And the state of the art is still using kind of semi-analytical models. So basically have a functional form that is calibrated um, against simulations. And it's been known for quite a while that this approach is only accurate at the roughly 10% level uh, if you add dynamic, if you add dark energy uh, WCDM models. And so a way to improve beyond this 10% or a proposed way is to do emulation. So this is basically saying you run a suite of numerical simulations for different cosmologies, and you then use some machine learning technique to interpolate between cosmologies so that you can have predictions at any cosmology. Here specifically, uh, I collaborated with the Mira Titan team at Argonne 
Uh, so the Mira Titan universe is a set of 111 cosmological n-body simulations led by Katrin Heitmann. And the plot here on the right shows those simulations. So we have an eight-dimensional parameter space with mega matter, so matter density, baryon density, neutrino density, changing sigma eight, the Hubble constant H, the scalar spectral index NS, and then a dynamical dark energy model with W naught and WA. And so every black point here is a two gigaparsec uh, cosmological simulation. So that's, um, if you're a machine learning person, you can just think of uh, all these black points as a training set. And we now want to, uh, to get uh, predictions for the halo mass function in between. So in practice, we do that uh, with techniques that are now standard. So Gaussian process regression, and we use PCA decomposition to get our model. So by now, as I said, this is pretty standard. Um, so instead of discussing all the details, I would like to show a uh, kind of a scientific highlight of that analysis. So we now have this uh, halo mass function emulation uh, throughout cosmo cosmology. That's accurate uh, at the few percent level. And so we can ask ourselves, well, how much better is this than the old approach. So, um, so what I did in this top panel here is I use a this kind of semi-analytic model and calibrate it on a Lambda CDM simulation in our set. That's this M000 simulation. And then I just use this model to predict what the other halo mass functions should look like. And you see basically here the ratio between what the mass functions actually are and what this rather simple model predicts. And you see that there's offsets by up to 20%. Um, where again, the emulator is much more precise as shown in the bottom panel. So here I'm showing four additional simulations we ran. So these were not used to train the machine learning uh, method. And so here again, I can ask, well, what would have the the analytical model predicted so that these are the dashed lines. So there are up to 10% uh, biases. Um, and if you look at the solid lines, which is the residual of the emulator with respect to these new uh, data that were not used to train it, well, you can basically not see the solid lines because the, the accuracy is better than 3% here. So what I'm saying is with this machine learning based emulator, um, we are improving from a 10% uncertainty to a better than 3% uncertainty. And this will be really important for next generation cosmology analyses. We really need to have very accurate model predictions. Okay, so that was a uh, highlight on simulations. Now let's switch gears back to weak lensing. We've been doing quite some work, uh, mostly led by uh, Tim Schrabach and his team, on getting more lensing data of high redshift clusters using Hubble. And so I would just like to highlight this plot here from the recent paper uh, by Hannah Zuren et al, where you can see that we now have lensing data for, um, sorry, the, the Hubble data set has increased from 13 to 30 clusters. And so we're now starting to be able to probe the evolution of the SZ signal of a wide redshift range, in this case from 0.25 to 1.7. And then we played different games here in this plot, trying to see, uh, so the red curve here is the mean scaling relation model. And then the data points are if we split our lensing data into different bins to try and see if our model is a good description. And given the rather large error bars, admittedly, um, we see no evidence that our rather simple model for the AZ signal um, is a poor description. So then in terms of cosmology, there's been quite a lot of progress. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few of them. Um, we did a joint analysis of uh, Planck and SPT clusters. So that was actually led by Laura Salvati and Alex Saro uh, in Trieste. So the idea is to, is to combine the wide and rather shallow Planck millimeter wave survey with the deep and rather narrow SPTSZ cluster survey. So you get depth and width which should be the best of both worlds. And uh, as I said, this was led by uh, Laura Salvati. 
And uh, so this, yeah, th this really gets to the full spectrum of what you can do with uh, SZ selected clusters. And that specific analysis, um, we still use the data from the weak lensing mass calibration data set from SPT. And then Planck added really the most massive clusters in the redshift smaller than 0.6 universe. Now again, switching gears and adding uh, another component to, um, to the program by adding data from the dark energy survey. So as you probably all know, the dark energy survey is one of the leading optical lensing surveys. And uh, just highlighting here uh, the DS year three result for cosmic shear and galaxy clustering that you've probably all seen, uh, which is really among the state of the art for large scale structure cosmology. But besides producing results like these, there's also been a very successful collaboration between DES and SPT for many years. And I would like to highlight um, some of them in terms of cluster science. So, uh, you know, highlighting also one of the, some of the synergies between doing millimeter wave and optical cluster cosmology. Also thinking of this as a precursor to when we'll have Rubin LSST data. As I argued in the beginning, the cluster detection uh, with the Sunya Zeldovich effect signal is very well understood, which admittedly cannot really be said for optical clusters, as we know from the SG1 uh, results, which are the gray contours here, and from other optically selected cluster samples, there seems to be a preference for obtaining lower omega matter values. And so an ongoing effort uh, is to use the SPT cluster sample to better understand optical selection in DES, for example. So two examples for that. On the left-hand side, uh, we used um, the richness mass relation. So the relationship between the optical cluster mass observable and mass for SPT clusters. And if you look at this plot here uh, in uh, Bleem et al. 2020, um, you see the mass observable relations. So the mass is a function of richness as uh, inferred um, you see by the DS cosmology analysis. And then uh, red is then uh, the, the, the analysis if you use the SPT selection and what we know about its relationship with mass. So the takeaway point is that there's a roughly, there was a roughly four sigma tension in the mass slope. You see this tilt. And this is also consistent with an early analysis where we use DS and SPT data jointly. And so, um, you know, to bring this back to the cosmology plot I showed, if we say that the mass relation, the mass observable relation is slightly tilted, then uh, you, know, you would expect this to have an impact in omega matter and sigma eight. And indeed, uh, Matteo Costanzi and et al. showed that if you use the SPT inferred richness mass relation, you actually shift this rather surprising result that's in pink here back to the black contours here, which are in much better agreement with what we think omega matter and sigma eight are. So I think that's a really nice example where using data from different surveys really added information and insight into what's going on. Of course, there's even more things we can do with joint SPT and DS analyses. And uh, I'd like to highlight this uh, since I'm very directly involved in this effort. Um, so DS can really offer two main things for, SPT cluster, for the SPT cluster cosmology program. Uh, first, I would just like to highlight advances in the SPT uh, cluster catalogs. So the results I discussed so far are based on the 2015 cluster catalog on the SPT SZ surveys, the first generation survey. But as I said in the very beginning, uh, we have collected data with SPT Paul, so the second generation camera. And uh, this is actually uh, organized in three sub-surveys. One is an ultra deep 100 square degree survey, SPT Paul 100 d there's a very wide 2,700 square degree, uh, relatively shallow extended cluster survey, so ECS. And we have the main kind of deep 500 square degree SPT poor 500D survey. And so also thanks to DES, you see the overlap between the surveys here on the top right. We're able to do the optical follow-up very nicely with DES data. 
And just uh, you know, as a um, uh, anticipating some of the outlook, we are taking data with SPT three G, as I said. So if we now add uh, the lensing aspect of the dark energy survey, um, so from the year three analysis, the dark energy survey has about 100 million lensing sources over 5,000, uh, sorry, 4,000 square degrees. And so if I now use these lensing sources to uh, do lensing measurements of SPT clusters, I can get uh, DES lensing information for 650 SPT clusters. So remember, this previous cosmological analysis was based on 32 clusters with lensing data, and we're now increasing to 650. So uh, expect huge improvements, and I'll come back to that in a second. On the right-hand side, I would just like to show visually the improvement of the SPT cluster sample. So the black points here are the mass redshift diagram for the first generation 2500 square degree survey. On top of that, we added uh, the 100, the deep 100D survey, so the green triangles pushing to lower masses because we're more, we add more sensitivity. And then really adding a lot of higher mass clusters from the SPT extended cluster survey in red. And what we want to do now, obviously, is turn this into an improved cosmological measurement. So summarizing the data we want to use for this updated cosmology analysis, the title basically says it all when you use clusters from the SPT SZ and SPT pole surveys. So this will this then covers over 5,200 square degrees. The cluster confirmation and redshifts is largely based on DES with a high redshift wise complement. So this is an effort uh, led by Matthias Klein here at LMU and a lot of targeted observing programs, which are led and coordinated by Lindsay Bleem and the SPT collaboration. So with this cluster set, uh, to give you some numbers, um, we are now talking about just over a thousand SPT selected clusters at redshifts greater than 0.25. Again, to compare that to the 2019 setup, we had 340 clusters, so we're basically uh, we now have about three times more clusters. And as I said, a lot more lensing data. As I described, uh, we have this expanded HST lensing data up to redshift 1.7. So we now have 30 clusters with Hubble. And as I described in the previous slide, we now have 650 clusters with DES lensing data. So um, showing the data again with some plots, at the bottom left, you see the histograms of the cluster sample, so the histogram and redshift, SPT detection significance, and the richness as measured in DES data. On the right, bottom right here, you see the lensing data in DES. Let me start in the middle. That's the tangential shear profile for individual clusters. And as we know, this is basically dominated by um, shape measurement uncertainties, so you don't really see anything here. But if you stack the clusters, uh, you start to really see a clear detection of the shear profile. And on the top here, I'm showing from full-scale mock analyses what improvement we expect in going from dark blue to red. So before doing that, I would just like uh, to spend one technical slide on a thing I have not discussed yet. Uh, I have not yet discussed anything about what we do about baryons. So as you all know, uh, this is a major worry uh, for cosmic shear and other power spectrum analyses because uh, of AGN and baryonic feedback. So this is how we plan to model this for uh, our program. So as you may know, uh, there's quite some literature basically saying that the mass function changes, and I'm part of that, uh, because AGN feedback redistributes the mass in halos. But we do not really measure halo masses. As I said, we measure mass proxies like the SZ or X-ray or optical richness and the lensing profile. And so instead of saying that the mass function changes, what we're preferring to do now is to say, well, really what changes is the halo mass profile. And so what this means uh, you know, in a nutshell is that we want to keep the gravity only simulations for calibrating the halo mass function and that we then use pairs of 
um, hydrodynamic simulations and gravity only simulations to investigate the change in the lensing shear profile. And this really gives us the best of both worlds. We have very accurate mass functions from gravity only simulations. And we then put the astrophysics um, into this additional uncertainty on the lensing profile. And so this is a work that was led by uh, Sebastian Grandis, who I believe gave a talk here a couple of weeks ago. And so we came up, or he came up with this very nice uh, cluster lensing framework. Where we put all uncertainties in lensing into a rather simple framework, which makes the analysis very efficient. And so just two numbers to take away from, you know, beside all technical complications. Um, the impact of baryonic effects, as we can measure it today, uh, for cluster lensing is about 2% in mass. The total systematic uncertainty in year three lensing data is about three to 6% in mass. So this means that hydrodynamic effects start to become important and is really a thing we'll start to worry about, especially for next generation analyses. Okay, so after this detour on our lensing modeling, and feel free to ask me more questions later, we are almost ready to do our cosmology analysis. Um, I say almost because so far this analysis on the real data is blinded to avoid, avoid confirmation bias. Um, we do a bunch of checks, especially on the lensing modeling blindly, because again, we want the analysis to be robust and not let, guided by you know, us believing what the correct cosmology is. So just what I would like to highlight is that we are running blinded chains as shown in the top right. So uh, the result from the real data is just arbitrarily shifted. I don't know what omega matter and sigma eight are for that analysis. But what I can show in the bottom here is again, you might probably recognize the data histograms and the shear profiles I showed earlier. What I can do is from the blind analysis, I can use the model outputs for the data and overplot them. So basically just checking that my model is describing the data. And as you see from this plot, qualitatively, yes, things seem to be working out very nicely. Our mean recovered model is going through the data. And so I'm quite confident that uh, when we when we'll unblind, um, that we get very nice results. So uh, that's kind of wrapping up this part uh, of the joint SPT and DES cluster cosmology program. And the main takeaway is really that we're combining the well understood cluster sample from SPT with the very good optical data for redshifts and lensing data for mass calibration from DES. And this is a very powerful data set. And I would just, you know, for completeness, because I don't have time to talk about everything uh, I find interesting, there's obviously lots of other very good teams who are doing similar cosmology analyses. And there should be a lot of really cool results coming out, um, I guess throughout 2023 and 2024. And I think this will be a huge step forward for cluster cosmology. So I'm, I'm very excited and I hope uh, you are as well. Now in the last remaining couple of minutes, I would just like to think even further ahead than uh, 2023 <clears throat> and discuss a little bit what we can do with SPT 3G. So that's the third generation camera on the South Pole Telescope. So some basic information, that camera was deployed in 2017. It's a huge camera. Uh, so it has a almost three square degree field of view, it has about 16,000 uh, um, transition edge sensor bilometers. So that's about an order of magnitude more than SPT pole. Still covering the 95, 150 and 220 gigahertz bands. And that gives you about arc minute resolution. Um, so now what can we do in terms of cluster science? Well, first, thanks to the huge number of detectors, we're really pushing down the noise levels. And so um, for cluster science, the main 3G survey is about 10 times deeper than SPT-SZ. Uh, we are also doing an extended, so a more northern survey with SPT-3G that's still three times deeper than SPT-SZ. And so really we're expecting thousands of clusters above about 10 to the 14 solar masses. And uh, I'm having here, here I'm showing the numbers for the number of clusters we'd expect. For example, about Redshift 1.5, we expect about 500 clusters. So this is really a game changer in terms of 
uh, SD selected clusters, really pushing to very high redshifts. So the cluster sample will just improve dramatically. A qualitatively new thing that will be very interesting with SPT3G is to do C cluster CMB lensing. So instead of using background galaxies for lensing, use the CMB. So the current level of CMB cluster lensing is at the three sigma detection level. And with SPT3G, for example, we're really going from three sigma detections to better than 5% mass calibration. So again, a huge step forward. So we're basically expecting CMB lensing to be as powerful as optical lensing. And so this will obviously be very important for cross checks and for really improving our uncertainties. Um, last but not least, the promised uh, plot from uh, earlier in this talk. Uh, here's a admittedly somewhat optimistic forecast for how we can use SPT3G clusters to probe the evolution of growth of structure since Redshift two, basically. So just note the huge improvement um, from orange to black. If you look very carefully, there are error bars in the black line. Um, I think this is somewhat optimistic, but it just highlights the potential for what SPT3G clusters can do. And with that, I'd like to summarize um, what I discussed in this presentation. So uh, clusters are a nonlinear probe of um, large-scale structure and as such centrally rely on numerical simulations. Um, I'm trying to make the point that SZ selected clusters have been playing a central role in the field since their emergence. Uh, weak lensing is a very crucial tool for mass calibration because we know how to model it and that there are only small um, remaining uncertainties due to cluster astrophysics. So we have a framework for modeling um, uh, the observable mass relations and to account for astrophysical uncertainties. Um, then, as I highlighted, I think there's a very interesting uh, analysis from SPT and DES coming up, and then really, uh, really a lot of super cool analysis from very different surveys coming up uh, this year, next, and the year after. So I think this is a really great time for cluster cosmology. And again, I would like to highlight for all the great work by these other teams that I had no time to discuss, and I hope you will hear talks from them as well. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I can take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Bouquet, for the very interesting talk. Um, so as you said, we now have time for questions from the audience. If you want, you can put your hand up here on Zoom. Um, and if you're on YouTube, you can post your question there and I'll read it out to our speaker. Um, I actually have a couple of questions if I can uh, start while people are getting ready to ask. Um, so I, I had a question like in the that's in the slide in the very beginning of your talk, but you've shown the slide again here, this this slide here, the 34. Okay. okay. Um, and that's regarding the large error bars on redshift. So for the uh, mm. the orange line uh, for redshift, between 1 and 1.5, you have a large error bar there. But this error bar is also very large um, for the SPT3G. Uh, yes, well, uh, it, it's not an error bar. Um, it's, uh, well, that was a, a matter of debate. Um, so it, it's basically showing you the, 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 the extent of the redshift bin. Um, and we did not find a better way to visualize it. But yeah, it's the extent of that bin. And so that's why they're curved to show that within this bin, we assume the, the Lambda CDM evolution. And so you should really just think of four bins, you know, with different okay. amplitudes. And it's, yeah, so it's really the, the extent of the bin. Okay, okay. Uh, that that makes more sense. But then how come, um, so for the same the same analysis, how how did you choose these bins? Because the, the last one is, is big. Is it because there were not that many clusters in that redshift bin? 
Yes, exactly. So it's uh, these four bins which shows to have basically the same number of clusters. And then okay. if you remember uh, the, the, the redshift distribution, uh, you know, there's a peak, the median redshift is at 0. 0.6. So that's why the, the two central bins are actually the narrowest one because that's where you have the highest density. And so that's definitely the high redshift tail is then where you need a huge redshift bin to have a quarter of the sample. Okay, thank you. I, I guess I got stuck. I've been working with um, with estimating right shifts recently. <laughs> and I always see like uh, large area bars. I thought this might be because of the, the bimodal nature of some of these red shifts distributions. Uh, but okay, so that explains it. Um, no, the, the individual cluster redshifts are are very good, like you know, percent level. Um. Okay. Uh, also, um, so you showed uh, the area right for the the this third generation. Will there be an overlap with Ruben? The I guess this is the one. Yeah. Uh, yes. Admittedly, yeah. I guess I should should update this, or I'm sure someone has this plot with Ruben. Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't, admittedly, I don't have it off the top of my head um, to paint it in there for you, but. But there will be. Yeah, and uh, some of it with Euclid as well, I believe. Um, yeah. Uh, I saw that it was deployed in 2017. When is it to, uh, I think this is in, in one of your previous slides. The uh, SPT3G, yes. Yeah, yeah it says 2017, but it's it's not on yet. Sorry, or no, it's, it's uh, deployed in 2017. I guess the, well, the, the, the first season was a bit tricky, but it's uh, taking fantastic data since 2018. And it's taking more data till uh, until 2024. And um, so in terms of, uh, yeah, so in terms of cluster science, the, the team's working on the first uh, catalog uh, led by Joshua Sobrin. Um, so from the first three years of data and uh, the, the plan is to have that ready by next year. So really the, you know, SPT3G is there and it's still taking data. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, th thanks for asking for the clarification. Yeah, it's it is taking data. Okay. Uh, do we have? Yes. So we have a question in the chat. Uh, Michelle, do you want to read it out loud, or shall I ask? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to read it. Sebastian, what do you foresee as the biggest challenge for SZ cluster cosmology on SPT three G? SPT3G, uh, great question. Um, well, I guess there's the technical part where, uh, I mean, so 3G, I guess, more data specific where other people, I guess, like uh, Lindsay Bleem and Joshua Sobrin are actually the experts uh, that if I go back all the way to the beginning, when I showed SPT pole, the SPT poll sky, um, so basically what we're, saying is that with 3G, we'll get many more of the you know, shadows, so SZ signals of clusters. But then you would immediately think that, well, you should also get many more of these bright point sources. And indeed, that's the case. And so I know that, for example, in the processing point of view, uh, you really need to start worrying about all these point sources. Um, so I think that's just a you know kind of a technical problem that as you go deeper in the data, you know effects that were not important yet will really become important. Um, in terms of you know, further down the uh, line, in terms of uh, cosmology, I think one uh, aspect that will be very interesting is, um, as I said, I would think that hydrodynamic effects on lensing profiles will become important or the uncertainty on it will become important. So we we'll really have to be very careful there. Um, 
I think uh, that's a place where CMB lensing, I think will be super interesting too, because, um, because uh, sorry, uh, lensing shear really measures delta sigma, as you know, so the density contrast, whereas CMB lensing measures the convergence. So I would have the hope that the hydrodynamic effects are actually less important for CMB lensing, but then for high precision CMB lensing, I think also we're, we're just starting to explore all the uncertainties that really need to be taken into account, like CIB contamination and all these great things. Um, so, but to, to try and summarize my view, I, I, I think it's that many, many small or currently small effects will start to be important. And the challenge will probably also just be to figure out which of the many potential problems we really need to be worried about and you know focus on the more most important ones um to you know to get done and so i think that that would be very interesting hey uh, michelle says thanks um do we have any more questions from the audience okay go ahead hey now hi sebastian uh, I have a question. Uh, it's more about the theoretical approach coming from the hydrodynamic simulations. I'd like to know how is the state of art in terms to, to understand better the scaling laws uh, for, let's say, for a given uh, redshift, you know, the, the cluster scaling relations, for example. Um. Well, so uh, I guess there's maybe two parts uh, to what I would like to say. I mean, first, um, <clears throat> as I said, in, 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 in this analysis approach, we're really only using the hydrodynamic simulations to learn about what, uh, sorry, here, what the, the mass distribution looks like. So as I said, the, the idea being that here, the hydrodynamic effects should be relatively weak but they will become important. Um, and so we're not actually using the, the prediction for, for example, the mass to SZ relation from hydrodynamic simulations in the analysis. But obviously what's uh, super interesting, and I think we, we should do more in this direction is to now say, well, you can measure the SZ mass relation in the simulation, and we have measured it empirically on the data and try to you know, now, now see if it matches, and if not, you know, what we can learn. Um, I, I think in general, we have not done enough of this kind of closing the loop and you know validating numerical simulations with what we measure. Uh, but definitely, um, as you know, I think you know there's lots of interest and uh, lots of people really starting to be very interested in that. And um, yeah, I think there will be a lot more of this work coming up. Also thinking about uh, you know another way that I think is very promising is, as you know, like cosmic shear analyses, really worrying a lot about the small scale power spectrum and the baryonic impact. And, you know, at least with, with clusters, at least we measure directly the baryon distribution in massive objects. Uh, obviously, there's still some extrapolation to you know, go to lower masses to get the power spectrum. But I think what's really interesting is that we're starting to, I think, close this loop between say cluster scale observables, power spectrum measurements and numerical simulations. And I think this will be ever more important. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Um, okay, we're at the hour. So if there are no more questions, we'll wrap this up. Um, this presentation will be available on our website and on Linea's YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and a very special thanks to you, Dr. Boke. Um, everyone, have a great day, stay safe, and I hope to see you all again in our next webinar.